Um, good evening, and welcome to Artist Space Books and Talks. Um, my name is Harry Buck. I'm assistant curator at Artist Space. And firstly, I'd like to thank you all for coming down here on this very beautiful uh, June evening. Um, we're hugely excited uh, to present a, a launch for Yates McKee's book, Strike Art, Contemporary Art and the Post-Occupy Condition, published by Verso. Strike Art presents perhaps one of the first significant attempts to historicize and problematize the legacy of the Occupy movement upon contemporary art. In the immediate vicinity of Zuccotto Park and the waves of protest, of protest that engulf major cities worldwide, through the work of groups and movements that emerge in the wake of and on occasions in response to Occupy, such as Black Lives Matter, Strike Debt, Free Cooper Union, the Global Ultra, the global ultra fac Luxury Faction, and the Decolonial Cultural Front, as well as through the historical lens of avant-garde and left art practice through the 20th century. Tonight, Yates is joined by fellow artists, organizers, writers, and activists, Nina Felshin, Amin Hussein, and Victoria Sobel, using the release of Strike Art to discuss the following proposition. If we are seeing a move from institutional critique to institutional liberation, it is imperative that an ethos of decolonization be developed in the process. So what does this mean and how do we do this? Um, Nina Felshin is an independent curator, writer, and activist. She is the editor of But Is It Art? The Spirit of Art as Activism, and this year edited the fake New York Times, produced by Jewish Voice for Peace, which parodied the paper's skewed Israel-Palestine coverage. Amin Hussain is an artist and organizer with groups including MTL, Global Ultra Luxury Faction, Decolonial Cultural Front, and Direct Action Front for Palestine. With Natasha Dillon, he is currently completing On This Land, a film about the Palestinian struggle. Victoria Sobel is an artist and one of the many founders of Free Cooper Union. She is currently a fellow at the Vera List Center for Art and Politics at the New School, where she is exploring alternative models of student governance, transparency, and accountability. Tonight's discussion will build on local art practice and activism developed through Occupy and beyond over the previous five years. However, it will also look forward to a project that has been initiated and organized by the advocacy group Common Practice New York that will see the art collective MTL in conjunction with Yates and other protagonists, some, some of whom are in the audience tonight, working to organize artist space as a decolonial cultural space. More regarding this might emerge in tonight's talk um, and will certainly emerge through the coming months. Um, lastly, um, I'd like to thank the Friends of Artist Space, the, contrib the contributors to the Artist Space Program Fund, as well as all of you here tonight for your generosity in supporting Artist Space programs, which couldn't happen without you. So thank you and turning over to our uh, participants. Thank you. Hello. Um, hi, everyone, for coming. Thank you so much for coming. Um, uh, and especially thanks to Harry and Rachel and Stefan and the whole staff at Artist Space for being so hospitable uh, to the event, and also the folks from uh, Verso for helping organize it as well, and my esteemed uh, friends and comrades here. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to try and keep it uh, fairly brief. I'm going to walk us through uh, a couple of the key... Um, uh, the key chapters of the book and just kind of let the images wash over you. I'm not going to go into great depth about uh, many of them. It's more to give you a sense of the kind of panoply and, and, and uh, spectrum of the types of material that are covered in the book. <clears throat> um, so the book is called Strike Art, Debris Art in the Post-Occupied Condition. Um, the actual book does not feature the exclamation point at the end, thankfully. So this was the original uh, cover design, and my wife said, that looks like the Jeb logo. People remember it was like, Jeb, right? So thank God at the last minute, Verso came through and like, let me take that off. Um, but one thing that the exclamation point was supposed to communicate was that it, um, the book and the analysis treats strike um, as a verb and not a noun, as an imperative or a call, or you could even say a kind of interpolation um, to its readers. Um, to engage in um, this activity of striking art. And it's a, it, it is meant to resonate with the history of thinking and doing associated with the strike as a labor tactic. But we've seen in recent years uh, the strike take on many other kinds of um, 
sites and many other um, kinds of tactics that expand beyond the formal workplace per se. Um, so that's one sort of allusion that it's meant to make, but also strike as a verb has a lot of interesting metaphorical qualities as well. The idea of giving some, striking something with a blow, um, putting something, like striking something from a tabulation, even putting it under erasure, you could say, <clears throat> in which the thing isn't simply destroyed and negated and done away with, but it's sort of, um, uh, it's reframed um, in such a way that it survives, but it's in a new context and it, it creates new possibilities and new effects. That's what um, we're trying to do with this idea of putting the idea of art under erasure. Now that's in dialogue with, but not the same as, the long history of sort of end of art narratives, right? <clears throat> Where there's the frustration that we all have working in the art institutional system of um, art's confinement, its alienation from politics or from everyday life, and the idea to abolish art and create a kind of sublation of art and life, right? That's a classic sort of avant-garde narrative with many permutations. The idea of striking art, though, is not that. It's not just about negating art. It's about um, sort of pushing it in a new direction, mining it for its unforeseen possibilities in an expanded field of political organizing. Um, and so, um, so I'll just say also, uh, speaking of avant-garde histories, and I say that sort of tongue-in-cheek, the image on the cover is a picture of NYPD uh, police commissioner uh, Bill Bratton covered in fake blood um, uh, after he was subjected to what you might call a kind of action painting um, uh, in the, uh, the aftermath of the failure to indict the police murderer of Eric Garner um, in late 2014 during a Black Lives Matter um, action. Okay, so I'm going to read a passage um, from the book that sort of sums up the ethos of what the, this idea of strike art is. It is written by the group MTL, which is comprised of, among other people, Amin and um, Natasha Dillon, who sadly can't be here. So I'm going to read out this passage, and then um, I'm going to move quickly through the images. Okay. So, and I must admit, there is a bit of an avant-garde flair here, but just uh, bear with us. Um, art as we know it is corrupt, exhausted, and weak. We strike art to liberate art from itself, not to end art, but to unleash its powers of action, imagination, and beauty uh, that have been held captive by the art world. Art does not dissolve into so-called real life. Art defamiliarizes life, rendering it surreal. Our surreal spirit is less that of Breton's European vanguardism than Suzanne Césaire's freedom dream, mindful as it is of the ongoing histories of slavery, imperialism, and debt. Art here opens directly onto our ways of existing and working together. How do we create spaces that counteract the multiple forms of oppression that structure our relationships? These are inseparable from how we reproduce our lives in a material sense, whether we think of an occupied park, a collective house, a neighborhood, a citywide network, or the planet itself. Art challenges us to respond to this question with direct action for which we ourselves are responsible, rather than any pre-existing institution. We strike art as a training in the practice of freedom. Okay. Um, and so this point about institution and institutionality is something that is woven throughout the book, because while many of the practices that I survey there are operating in almost complete indifference to places like artist space or to the institutional institutions of the art system, we've also seen a kind of doubling back on the part of art organizers targeting the institutions of art as sites of organizing um, and action in their own right. Okay, so here goes the bask in the images part. Okay. Okay, first chapter. I talk about um, discourses surrounding the relation of art and democracy. Um, democracy understood as something that exceeds the narrow parameters of liberal electoral democracy that uh, is kind of dominates the meaning of that term in the United States uh, from 1987 to 2011. And that, that time frame is strategically selected because I begin uh, with the work of ACT UP. Um, and ACT UP being a direct action movement that was intimately entwined with, but far exceeded, uh, the realm of the art system and was able to leverage its resources and its possibilities. Um, I then look at the fulguration of cultural production around the anti-corporate globalization movement, 
Um, I look at the work of people like Martha Rossler um, and group material in the 1980s and 90s, often operating in alternative spaces, such as uh, a place like Artist Space. And then I track the way in which some of those energies uh, end up getting sort of institutionalized for better or worse and in different forms in something like creative time. And I take a lot of time with the work um, of Nato Thompson, who's a sort of frenemy of sorts, you could say, um, but much, much respect to him. But um, I look at the way in which uh, the advent of Occupy ends up being a crisis for and a kind of limit point to what we know as so-called socially engaged art practice, namely large, well-funded institutions. Um, it's almost a kind of non-profit industrial complex, you could say, of socially engaged art at this point. Um, programming and managing and evaluating and assessing um, kind of small scale or sometimes bigger scale sort of experimental artwork that is almost always divorced from any larger social movement, right? It's this kind of incubators of critique or debate or provocation, um, but that are, are not part of larger collective mobilization. Now again, the latter does not have to be our absolute criteria for whether art is good or interesting, but it's a different thing. Occupy, I describe in the book as a kind of Baduian truth event. Right? Something that punches a hole in the kind of constituted order of knowledge, of our expectations, the norms and protocols of what we understand art to be, what we understand ourselves as, as working in the art field, what that means. Um, and opening up this new field of possibilities, but also um, risks and dangers and struggles that are far exceed what you would typically do in, an, in a typical art institution. Okay. <clears throat> so. First okay, so the first chapter is kind of my take on basically the 90s and 2000s, right? This question of democracy um, as it's articulated in various, uh, both in direct action movements but also in the art system. Uh, then I have a reading um, of uh, Occupy Wall Street itself um, based at um, uh, Zuccotti Park, just a few blocks from here but looking at all the historical strands that went into that moment, the kind of the conjunction of circumstances and forces that made Occupy possible when and where it did, including the, the artist-run space 16 Beaver. It was a, a crucible, um, a kind of cosmopolitan incubator over the course of the previous decade that brought together the folks uh, that would ultimately respond to the Occupy Wall Street famous uh, kind of injunction from adbusters, and that was all adbusters ever did was send out this one meme, right? So props to them, but it was taken up by um, this cosmopolitan group who had organized at uh, 16 Beaver, and then an alliance with broader anti-austerity and labor coalitions as well. And of course, the historical strands feeding into that include the history of the New York um, anarchist left. It includes the inspirations of things like Tahrir Square and Puerto del Sol, it includes the anti-austerity actions in Wisconsin. And also the term Occupy, it should be said, in our recent history was really first established and amplified by uh, militants in the University of California system in 2009. So they, they deserve a, a great deal of credit for creating this term that is much more than a tactic. It's also a kind of imagination. It's a verb an imagination for reclaiming what is already ours, as the, the old saying goes. Um, through the use of direct action, through the physical presence of the body, through the disruption and the shutting down of business as usual, normal operations. Okay, so I have a kind of close reading of, of the, the camp uh, at Zuccotti Park. Um, I then look at some, and I, and I highlight the importance of artists as organizers in this context. So it's not like Occupy happened and then along came the artist to decorate it or make a banner or write a poem, right? Artists themselves were integral to the conceptualization and the execution of the camp. And indeed, in a sort of speculative way, a lot of the best commentators on Occupy, including people like Martha Rossler, Nathan Schneider, Michael Tausig, and others, have been attuned to the fact that arguably, Occupy itself could be considered a kind of artwork. Now, in saying that, right, we risk the old aestheticization of politics, right, the Gesamtkunstwerk that Benjamin warned against, but there's something there. There's something there, right? And it's not just that artists in the professional sense were the organizers. It's organizers who 
themselves may not identify with or even care about art as we understand it in the art system, themselves became artists of sorts as well. So this mutual imbrication of artists and organizer. Okay, I then look um, at a number of practices emerging in the immediate aftermath of the eviction of Zuccotti Park and the other camps throughout the country, including the work of Not an Alternative, um, Occupy Homes, the Illuminator, which is this giant Christoph Wodischko style projection unit that's still very much in use today. Uh, the third chapter talks about the overlapping of the figures of the artist, the worker, and the debtor, um, with an emphasis, not exclusively, on um, the, the how precarious, precarious labor was conceptualized by Occupy activists, um, and how the figure of the, cult, the precarious cultural worker right, might form an alliance with the broader uh, sort of uh, arena of precarity um, in which artists actually are quite privileged compared to the precarity uh, that many other workers um, experience. So negotiating what does solidarity look like between different sort of parts of the broader class composition um, is, a, is a major question. Also, artists starting to identify as workers and as debtors is a big development at this time. Um, and a crucial uh, element of this whole configuration is the work of Free Cooper Union. We're really honored to have Victoria here who will tell us more about that. Okay, let me move a little bit more quickly. Um, I talk about the work of Strike Debt and the Rolling Jubilee Project. Um, I talk about the Gulf Labor Coalition and the Global Ultra Luxury Faction, which is best known in the past few years from do for its um, uh, creative direct actions targeting the Guggenheim Museum uh, for its use of heavily debt bonded uh, migrant labor from South Asia um, and its attempt to issue and sort of skirt responsibility for the labor conditions that it actually oversees in the construction of Guggenheim Abu Dhabi. And it should be said it's not, only, uh, it's not only Guggenheim, it's also NYU, the Louvre, the British Museum, it's a whole ultra luxury complex of these art institutions. Um, and then the final chapter um, looks at a number, the, the role of art practices in a number of movements that are certainly not coterminous with Occupy, and certainly don't emerge out of Occupy, but are nevertheless sort of in a way part of the same historical moment in some way, and that includes the climate justice movement and also the movement for black lives. Um, and in that chapter, I talk about the work of Occupy Sandy, the People's Climate March, uh, Flood Wall Street, um, actions targeting art and cultural museums um, for their complicity with fossil fuels industry like Liberate Tate. Um, and then I look at the aesthetic practices of the movement for black lives, particularly the, the phase directly following uh, the Ferguson uprising. Um, and looking at some of the, the tactics used there, including actions by the Black Youth Project 100 at the Museum of Natural History in 2015, uh, the Say Her Name, campaign, and then an exhibition in 2014 at uh, Smack Mellon um, that was a kind of immediate response uh, to the uprisings taking place at that time, um, but that actually tapped into a much longer set of discussions and traditions even um, of art making in response to state violence and um, uh, uh, anti-black uh, 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 state uh, racism. Um, okay. And, uh, and then uh, the final part of the book ends examining the intersections and overlaps and solidarities between the movement for black lives and uh, the movement for Palestinian freedom, um, uh, including the work of the, de uh, of the Direct Action Front for Palestine. Um, and then finally, and this now takes us beyond the book, uh, looking at some recent actions, or we'll talk about tonight, some recent actions taking place at the Brooklyn Museum targeting a pair of exhibitions, one that performs a kind of art washing of Israeli apartheid called This Place, um, and then the controversy that some of you may know about the complicity of the Brooklyn Museum with the real estate industry, um, and ironically enough, at the very same time that it's hosting a real estate summit, it's also hosting the show Agit Prop, which is 100 years of activist art, including many of our friends from my book, such as Illuminator, Not an Alternative, Occupy Museums, like our Right? Uh, and so we look at the way in which artists have tried to sort of navigate and critique and also directly intervene um, in the space of uh, Brooklyn Museum, most recently with this action called Decolonize This Place that intervened in both uh, shows.
Okay, and then finally, just as a kind of phrase to get out in the world, and I'm not exactly sure what it means, but it's a sort of, it's a provocation. Um, and I must say this emerges from a dialogue with uh, the people at Not an Alternative, um, is this phrase, it's almost a kind of art historical narrative, but it's also a, a provocation. From institutional critique to institutional liberation. Now, institutional liberation can be a very multivalent term. Um, what is an institution? What is liberation? Right? Obviously, those open up a whole deep set of, of questions. Um, to home it in a little bit, though, you can think about some of these actions that emerge out of an Occupy milieu, but that have doubled back on the institutions of the art system. You look, and so you can almost have a kind of typology. You have something like Gulf targeting 1% Museum of Guggenheim. Uh, you have a place like Artist Space that has been very hospitable uh, to kind of politically engaged art practices. And in fact, this is an image from this very room in 2012 where we celebrated the launch of the Rolling Jubilee Debt Abolition Project, um, which we can say more about, but that, that picture is right there. And Artist Space was a, a lovely and very generous uh, host. And then, um, so Artist Space, part of the broader ecosystem of alternative spaces and that tradition going back to the 60s and 70s of alternative spaces that, um, in principle at least, are not, um, uh, uh, are not um, subjected or shouldn't be subjected, let's say, to the market forces nor the imperatives of big monster institutions like the Guggenheim and are supposed to be carving out a space for experimentation and for, um, uh, for, for new kinds of uh, 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 practices, artistically and politically, to emerge. Um, and then you have a place like Mayday Space in Bushwick, and Bushwick being really kind of at the, uh, the frontier of struggles against gentrification and displacement in New York in a place like Mayday Space or The Base or Woodbine. Um, these are places that are entirely autonomous from the art system at all and yet are places where beautiful and abundant artworks that are directly embedded in uh, organizing campaigns are being produced at the moment. So there's a kind of spectrum for what this term could possibly mean, um, but that's something to kind of meditate on and, and, and speculate about if we're gonna be building these alternative institutions, whether in the shell of the old or inventing them from scratch, right, the imperative um, of decolonization, right, that, that it comes as much from the Palestinian struggle as it does from the indigenous struggle, as it does from Black Lives Matter, has to be at the central, at center of these efforts. Because as we know, the art system and the, the new art forum actually talks about this in a very um, in a very rich way. The art system as we know it has been a, a space of white supremacy. It doesn't, there's been much resistance and much reform and much transformation, but nevertheless as an ecosystem, um, it itself is a, it needs to be and has been a target of critique and transformation in its own right. Okay, thank you for listening. That's where I'm gonna finish for now. <clears throat> Okay, and so next we have um, Victoria. Oh, excuse me, yeah, let me sit. Uh, while Yates is setting up uh, my slideshow, I just wanted to uh, take a second to thank him for all of the amazing work he did to pull together this book and also to my co-panelists because um, it's just really a very humbling experience to be able to share um, just a small faction of what uh, Yates has related in this book in context of Amina Nina's work as well. Um, oftentimes, as a, a young artist in debt, it feels rather niche to be working on some of what I'm about to be sharing with you, but um, having dialogues such as this in a space uh, with a great history like this helps uh, give me perspective as well, so. There with us, folks. We're almost there. There, there we go. Yeah, we're back one. Your feet. Oh. Is that right? Is that right? Okay. Space bar. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here, let me move this over. Is that okay? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not a. I'm not great with technology.
Um, okay, so I just wanted to start off actually by saying that it's not really clear to me what I'm doing these days. Uh, I'm a young artist in debt. I'm actually not a student at the moment. I am not a uh, part of any formal institution, though I am uh, with my friend Casey, my collaborator, uh, a fellow at the Verilis Center. Uh, and during this current phase, um, the area of um, the area we're studying is post-democracy, and I think later on I want to talk about how we actually interpret post-democracy as podemo, as in yes, we can. Um, but uh, not being a student and coming to talk about uh, Free Cooper Union and Occupy Wall Street, I can't, I've come to think at these talks um, that maybe I should be sharing a bit more of the type of writing and reflections that my peers and I have been um, struggling with the past few years to put in context the different works, struggles, and um, just many different efforts that people have, uh, have put on the line. So I thought I'd start by reading actually a poem and then I was going to also do a survey um, in the way of Yeats. And I think I'll just try and do it rather quickly and I thought that um, during the Q&A, if all of this is rather incoherent, uh, please ask me any types of direct questions. I've also brought a stack of uh, primary documents, both from Occupy and Free Cooper Union, um, to share. Loving at a velocity where our minds and bodies were both optimizing on different planes of existence. Putting our bodies ahead of us, ahead of our minds. Maintaining a distance, maintaining conditions and dynamics. Choosing to stay where we put our bodies. Life as parametric. Do we build buildings to be walked around? I'm blind to my own vision. How do externalities dampen this reflex? How do they change, degrade, morph over time? Incoherency a situation, courier on colored paper. These modes seem outdated, they date themselves. Empty mind in a time of sunsets. Sight with a lot of totalitizing statements. I'm struggling to literally buy back my own time, but from who? Like a soft knot in the ruins, who owns my time? How is the exchange rate a debt? An experience that refuses to offer meaningful fulfillment. There's no co complete, comprehensive translation of experience. Consider the obliquescence. Consider the walk. Consider the incidental inconceivability of knowing the full scope of possibility. What's provocative these days? None of this being acceptable. Unethical opportunism. Let's make sure to raise the questions. Let's. Writing being over looked over, repeatedly being overlooked. Trying to reproduce the world. What's really unthinkable these days? Relative autonomy, or autonomy in spite of a shell breaking out of context, desperate and self-aware. A turtle breaking out of a shell, breaking out of an egg. The person who loses control of the consequences. People usually don't build a ship while sailing. Why are we ourselves? You can't stage life, but that doesn't stop people from trying. If you start building it, you will have to do the unthinkable. But what's really unthinkable these days? Small funny thought. Painful incongruities govern life. Have I missed my prime? The old life ruiner. Acutely oblique anti-marketing aspiration. Asymptotic half-life diminishing returns. Time, space, velocity. I can't see what's right in front of me. Forgiveness without condoning until they are incomprehensibly outside of an alternative. I know analogies develop over time. Analogical, involuntary, existential. Opportunity dangles. Am I ever looking at you? Where are they? How to get away from the idea of posing as harmless. False provocations. I want to be a mirror. Picture me where I want to be. Look at me now. The kind of threat posed by books. Real counterculture has been eclipsed by heightened state intervention, probably because of the cumulative nature of being. The focus, on, the focus being on the suffering of others to contextualize the success of others. Middle happens. Inevitable, immobilized, capped on both sides by instability, a door that doesn't look like a friend, a conversation that undoes itself, a table that forgets how to be a table, determined knowledge, performance anxiety. Other scholars characterize it as a form of midwifing. You can calculate the future to the presentness of the present. Small force, interstitial, in between, hard to see happen. Replace, replacing crisis in our creations that exist beyond. We were moving one way or another. We might as well be involved by authoring it instead of being consulted, if at all. This type of framing is practically useful, practically. I feel as though the world's changed around me and I haven't kept up, or worse, I've been left behind. It's worse because I don't even want to exist anymore. 
buildings that forgot their buildings. None of this interests me at all. I'm thinking about the past a lot. Mostly, I don't recognize we self. The ending no longer exists. The exist no longer exists. The entrance no longer exists. We've been inhabiting a mirage, the stalactile impossibility of stopping a lumbering institution that refuses to focus on the stated purpose. The stated purpose no longer exists. We've been inhabiting a, where are the beneficiaries? Man as receiver, consumer, subject, author, builder. Materials existing for our use to do as we see fit. Mirage is a means of demonstrating implicit violence, though historically the shock value is easily internalized and not often leveraged. Enacting beyond free, aspiration is about oversimplified transactional exchanges. Everything is about oversimplified transactional exchanges. Small funny thought, painful incongruities govern life. Incoherency is the historical actuality of persons and events. How could we have no idea what I like these days? Reflections. Um, and so that's something that uh, I wrote with a bunch of my peers, uh, thinking back on many of our experiences, having been thrown uh, into actually Yates has a very good way of putting it, not the art world, but the art system, and being a young artist that chose to involve myself in the art system via an institution, being the Cooper Union that was crumbling around me, um, I've begun to think a lot about, and actually Cooper Union, <laughs> It's just this tiny little triangle in the bottom corner. I've begun to think a lot about space, temporality, um, the layout of the land, and just how tiny, uh, but and tiny distilled, but also meaningful, all of the different um, all of the different efforts that Yeats outlines in his book are. Um, if you don't know about Cooper Union, it was built in 1859 by uh, the philanthropist Peter Cooper, who himself did not receive um, an education due to the debt of his father. Um, it came to be actually the tallest building in New York City, being six stories tall at the time in 1859, and offering a free education to women, people of color, immigrants, uh, and the likes, and that being a very radical move at the time. Uh, over the course of history, essentially, that mission became um, co-opted in uh, the distinction between public and private institutions and the commodification through accreditation processes and many of the other different facets of um, college and collegiate efforts that we know to be true today, such as expansion and cost structure. Um, most of my experience at the Cooper Union started uh, in the year 2008. Um, many of you know that to be the time of the recession, so kind of a weird time to enter college. Um, and the area being right around Astor Place in the Lower East Side looked much like this, so under construction. Um, Cooper Union is known not only for offering a free, uh, a free no tuition um, education in the fields of art, architecture, and engineering for undergraduate students, but also for having an endowment and a board that was able to manage an endowment that allowed them to sidestep the recession. Um, here is the past president and one of the board members in a very elaborate architect built new building which is uh, seated on the site of this demolition. Um, oftentimes it feels like that when I come to present at a talk like this, my memories exist only in this form. This is probably the case for most of you as well. Um, it's very difficult to think about what to share, how, and how they're just images really stacked on one another, but um, I was quite thankful to know that a lot of my friends, peers, and collaborators are also in the audience, and I thought, I, I was joking to Yates um, before this started, you know, maybe it would have been better if we all just uh, read the introduction to the book, because it's actually quite powerful, and offered a real um, insight to me and how I could talk about um, the different aspects of the projects I've worked on as a way of demonstrating that uh, all of the different mobilizations that Yates has talked about really exist prismatically, um, and any can be expanded and contracted to be thought about in association with each other or by themselves. So taking from this, uh, I wanted to start actually to say that uh, in the middle of my education, I, uh, I became really disenfranchised with the idea of fine arts. Um, it was 2011, I had really no prospects. I was receiving a great education um, with professors like Sharon Hayes and Marlene McCarty, both really active um, figures in ACT UP and many other really political, powerful movements, but I myself felt that I had no, um, no method of relating my experience, no faculty that looked or had gone through the things that I had gone through, and that became a really uh, challenging prospect given that I was taking on a lot of debt to go to a free school. Um, I found myself at the end of the day on September 11th um, 
at Occupy Wall Street, but after the day of rage had passed. Um, I'm sorry, September 17th, um, 2011. At the end of the day, after the day of rage had passed, at the first General Assembly, um, I didn't identify as an activist. I hadn't really done any previous activism, um, but I was really enticed. My background is in, again, performance, studies, publication, DIY arts and music spaces, and I was quickly drawn to the magnetism of what I saw around me. Um, I was enrolled <laughs> I was enrolled as a full-time student, but I ended up going home, um, and I was uh, really active in the dumpster diving scene, so I went home, and I, I'm not sure if you guys ever saw this, but I uh, made the first uh, document that was at Occupy Wall Street, which was a dumpster diving map, because most of the people that were coming to Occupy Wall Street at the time were not from the area, and many of them were stayed uh, in the camp and not on Wall Street because we couldn't get on to Wall Street. Um, because they were from out of town. So actually the first two weeks of uh, Occupy Wall Street, we ate a lot of dumpstered food and this was one of the first documents. Um, I love the photo that Yates shared earlier of the park being full, but the park that I remember for the most part existed on a schedule like this. Morning circle, first March, break GA, second March GA, GA standing for General Assembly. Um, it quickly blossomed into a much larger effort. This is the early media tent. I thought also about the truth action, um, and I've thought to myself about the art action, because actually, when I think about Occupy, I think of a time of abstention. Um, I think of a time when I gave up going to school as a student, and when I gave up having any uh, legibility as a person, essentially stopped working, stopped living at my house, stopped in some ways existing, because I didn't really know anyone at the park. Um, and so I really think of it as a time of abstention, and because I was so disenfranchised uh, with the art system, I actually took on an, my personally an abstention from art when I came to the park, and I, Amin and I have also joked about this. We, uh, he didn't know I went to Cooper Union or that I was an artist because actually while I was at the park, I worked doing things like finance, um, media, and the kitchen. Uh, and a lot for, for most of, uh, I would say that it was intentional, essentially. I did not want to be, at the time, associated with the arts. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I didn't believe that it was a way to um, use my skills or my the things that I had to offer, um, though I came to be very inspired by many of the other artists and the way that they were able to make meaningful um, organizing. Got arrested a bunch of times. Um, again, I helped set up the financial structure, which ended up being a fiscal, non uh, fiscal uh, sponsorship, which actually ended up being kind of modeled around the country at different occupations. Um, so that people could have different access to ways of organizing in a more long-term uh, way. I thought it's really funny coming out of Occupy that, um, and just having resumed life as an artist, that sometimes I come across something like this where uh, conspiracy theories connecting me to Joseph Stieglitz. Um, <laughs> it's kind of fun to think uh, that, and actually if the, the original Huffington Post article says that I was like stuffing money in my bag to buy vegan pizzas, um, so it's kind of layers and layers of fictionalized uh, accounts of what happened and how they happened and that's been really interesting and actually to me it's very powerful to have um, not only Yates but also Nathan and many other people's books that kind of stand as a countermeasure to the way that media tried to mediate uh, what was going on at the park and it was a big part of why I uh, took place in the, the um, self-made media of the park which largely happened through social media, live stream, post-production, this is what a lot of it looked like, and a lot of it happened at community spaces just like Yates uh, described. This was nearby, um, and these are all, actually all of these people were probably 10 to 15 years my senior, and many of them were uh, worked in news, documentary, professional photography, post-production, and they all had, in whatever capacity, left their practices to come strategize around how we could create uh, movement-based media, and I just was completely drawn to how that functioned, um, though, you know, it was, it was very difficult to scale, and we did struggle to try and um, make a distributed model for other occupations to do the same, but the virality of um, what happened in uh, the, um, in Tahrir and, and many other places provided a really good model for the people of Occupy to kind of tap into that energy. Oftentimes my day looked like this, uh, running a generator off of a stone table on the left hand side of the park, um, protecting it from the rain, uh, downloading footage. I actually brought, um, I actually brought the tapes I have from the raid um, because I was in the park while, <laughs> while I was being raided. 
but uh, there are many different uh, ways that one could think about all of the different creative actions that happened at the park and documentation, script, text are all of extreme interest to me in the aftermath. Um, there were, again, many different spaces that served, um, that served the movement. This was 339 Lafayette, which is the War Resisters League. Um, they're going to be moving somewhere nearby here. And I just thought uh, I would include this photo uh, because this is, again, really true to kind of how the nature of this space also functions as some, a place where people can come to do an experimental type of sharing of knowledge and work. Um, and I hope that the new uh, musty space will actually also function to help many different types of groups uh, do their work. I've always included this one because I really did live in the park for 65 days. Um, this is... Uh, this is just a shot that I, I, don't know, I don't know who took it, but this is the, the media, the Global Rev media tent. Again, we had to kind of run a generator to be constantly updating uh, the different types of media, but it was under this, the backlight of Brookfield and these, uh, all of these different like, crazy buildings. Um, this is a photo of the day that they cleared the park. Um, I was forcibly cleared from the park and in some ways, I was talking to one of my collaborators, I don't actually revisit most of these Occupy images that often. And even as I uh, began my work uh, with Free Cooper, which is about to come up, I tend to not talk about it that much, um, though I think people remember, remember me from that time and uh, the different types of things I did, but it was actually very difficult. Um, the, the removal from the park was very difficult. I think a lot of people, myself included, suffered from uh, PTSD from it. Uh, actually, I, in a crazy twist, the park was cleared. Uh, it took the course of the whole evening, the NYPD, the FDNY, the sanitation department. Um, and I saw a lot of things. Again, I have the footage, if anyone, well, maybe we should screen it sometime. Um, but essentially, uh, that took all night. And um, in the morning, I kind of just walked to Cooper Union. And uh, I was fully enrolled at the time, and I unenrolled. Fast forward, um, next year I decided I think I better finish my education. I only have one year left. Um, there were many other groups uh, post-Occupy that were beginning to um, coalesce, but it wasn't something that I felt I could really take on in the time because I really, uh, I just really didn't have it in me. So I tried to return to school only to find out that my beautiful full tuition paying like institution was actually in shambles. Um, all of that information about sidestepping the financial crisis was a lie. Uh, the board of trustees had been uh, leeching off of the endowment for essentially decades, depleting it. And uh, not only were we at a standstill about whether or not uh, the school could begin, would begin charging tuition or not, uh, the community itself was not being uh, consulted at all. So this, so my return to uh, school in the fall of 2012 was actually one that was a continued experience of many of the lessons I learned at Occupy. Um, okay, perfect. Um, I'm gonna kind of go through these next photos kind of quickly because some some they might you might be familiar with. Um, this is actually. <laughs> This one you might not be. This is the bylaws of the school, and a lot of what we did was kind of forensic, tracing through um, how the board had begun to slowly change these documents over time. Um, this is perhaps, these photos are perhaps the ones you've seen in the news, and they're the ones of um, creative direct action um, that Free Cooper Union came to be known for. I'm just one of many, many, like hundreds of people that were involved, and um, it wasn't just uh, Cooper Union community members, it was actually all of the people from Occupy that I had worked with, all of the local community members, people across the country, people from Quebec, um, people from many different institutions uh, that were lending not only solidarity but actually tactical help on the ground, um, whether it was legal assistance, parades, marches, interventions. Um, this is another demolition. This is a quite small photo, but that's actually the students during, during a, an occupation. We actually did two. One was a 10-day occupation of the clock tower up here, and the next was a 65-day occupation of the president's office, which would come a few months later um, upon the announcement that the school would begin to charge. Um, this is one of my favorite um, actions, which was students wrapping the board of trustee in a, a transparency parade, so that's Saran Wrap. So it was a demand for transparency and accountability. 
Um, I just wanted to mention that we did actually take a lot from Occupy. Uh, I was able to bring in a lot of people as facilitators, trainers, coordinators, support, logistics, and many other, t and artists, again, a lot of us being art students, um, to collaborate on many of these actions. Uh, and we weren't just demanding that our school be free. It wasn't about securing anything for ourselves because actually we would all be grandfathered into our, um, our full scholarship program should the school start to charge. Really, we were trying to make a point that uh, there wasn't actually any process by which this change was happening and actually it, was, it stood something that I think, um, when I think about the, one of Yates' charges about um, how we can de decolonize um, arts institutions, I have two thoughts, and one is that we need to think about um, diversity beyond inclusion, and the other is that actually um, in movement spaces, losses tend to be quite communicative. So that is to say that uh, once Cooper began charging, many, many arts and non-arts institutions stood to benefit from, uh, from the media's display of this as a failed model. Right to say that this this can't work. It's an antiquated thought. When in reality, there had been very rigorous, granular research done into how the school could sustainably remain free, and actually how you could scale other free institutions. But that was not the choice that was being made because the board wanted to take out additional loans to um, to pay off other expenditures that they had taken. Uh, and so, actually, if we can, if we know that losses are communicative, it actually stands to follow that most wins are isolated. Um, and so around the country this year, I didn't include them any slides about it, but there have been very many student uprisings and um, many of them have had very major impacts on their campuses, but they're often written off as one-offs or in isolation. Um, again, this is the Free University May Day. This is the second occupation. We had a lot of trouble dealing with the media. And so even though we knew that the media would write their own story and we were uh, struggling to write our version of the story, uh, the New York Times and many other different media were covering what we did differently. This was um, Charis. Many of you might know Charis El Bojillo. It's a Lower East Side historic uh, community space that was taken over by developers. And so we were collaborating with them. Uh, we went on to work in other spaces nearby, such as the Bruce High Quality Foundation University, which lent us uh, their space for off-campus organizing when the campus essentially was uh, cut off to the students. We began to think of other types of plans and ways to scale the different types of demonstrations we were working on. Uh, we levitated the foundation building, just like the Pentagon. Uh, we made giant placards. We, had, uh, we, we took, again, lessons from our Occupy friends about how to, um, how to organize. And this is, again, about um, losses being communicative. Um, at the same time that, oh, do you think it died? I can keep it there, I think. I don't know what happened. Um, this is, uh, perfect. Um, at the same time that um, CUNY and Cooper were essentially both uh, drafting new codes of conduct for their students, both were kind of leeching off of other schools who had a kind of a predatory model of restricting student access via governance changes. And the Times, again, went on to facilitate and meet, further mediate that communication um, as a loss. And this, this is what sets precedent for organizing. And it actually, uh, it's a burden. It's a like, counter burden. That's, it's um, a bad representation. Um, in that time, we struggled a lot to think about if we should continue on as a group. Uh, many have gone on to do different types of work. Uh, places like Facebook are not the best, uh, the kind of ticking time. Um, we began to, again, um, think about different ways we could co-opt the narrative, launching our own uh, New York Times article about how Cooper Union abandoned the plan to charge tuition, which was, this was based off of an article about how the New York Public Library um, abandoned its plan to renovate its facility. Uh, we looked at a lot of other different colleges. Antioch College, if any of you are familiar, also had a, um, a closing of the school and reopening at the hands of the alumni. And if you haven't heard of it, you should definitely check out Nonstop Antioch. Very um, strong community effort. <laughs> I think it's a PDF. Sorry. And essentially, they had this idea um, of nonstop Antioch, which meant that even though the school had actually uh, physically been closed, 
that they would have a nonstop effort in um, reestablishing it themselves. Um, and actually it ended up working. The school reopened its campus and they just graduated their second class and are on their way back towards accreditation. But this idea of a nonstop effort was very poetic to us. Um, and so we kind of abandoned the Free Cooper moniker and took on this new idea of um, nonstop. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I think we're there. Sorry, Casey, I know I'm not doing it right. <laughs> what do I do? Oh, I think it's me. It might be because it's about to. Sorry, I think we're at 3% battery. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so we're at non-stop. So even though we're stopping, we'll say it's here. It's a non-stop. It's actually a non-stop. Non-stop, yeah. <laughs> Is that right? From 38. Yeah. yeah. From the folder, though. 38? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to select it. Yeah. Oh, Maybe just, maybe just more like that. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right, folks, let's bring it back. Sorry for the interruption. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, so nonstop. And actually, in the end, um, my collaborators and I, many of them from Free Cooper and also broadening our community base, uh, had a temporary residency in the old St. Mark's book so bookshop space, which was actually ousted by the Cooper Union. And we um, used the space for about a month to try and draw attention not only to the empty space and the fact that artists don't have affordable space to do this type of organizing work, um, but to really make points, again, yeah, about community space. Um, Uh, at the same time, board members were still using the Times and many other media as a place to talk about why free tuition is not the answer. Uh, a popular question at the time was, what was the question? Um, we began to reconsider um, the red and black and the, and the different forms of ac activism that we had adopted previously um, and tried to reconsider that actually everything from Occupy to Free Cooper felt not unlike a dream and that actually everything around us was, uh, was really in a suspended dreamlike state, so we kind of adopted a new look. Um, these are the types of meetings we had. They were in raw spaces just like this. Um, this, is a, this is a window text that was painted on the window. Um, we thought that really text is image uh, and could be used as a provocative means and that poetry was a really actually a very good way to get to communicating with people. Um, we had issued, obviously, many uh, manifestos and very serious documents about finances and the state of higher education, but actually we identified very strongly with, our, um, with visual arts and with poetry and language. Um, this year, I'm, again, I've graduated, but this year the students uh, made history by protesting and um, moving to degender all of the bathrooms at Cooper Union. This is a very pressing issue around the country, not just in uh, institutions of higher education, but really all institutions. And 
Um, though I've seen a lot written about it, I think it's very hard for others to mobilize on this win that happened um, from the students because actually it's thought of as just being specific to our institution, being specific to this effort, being specific to this community when really this is a very um, pressing issue. Uh, we've thought a lot more broadly about reflections. Um, this book that I read, um, that poem from the beginning is actually called Reflections, and I have a few copies if anyone wants to take a look later, but we've thought about the materiality, um, where our buildings come from, how real estate works, uh, what happens when institutions are um, foreclosed upon. In fact, the quarry that the building was built upon was itself foreclosed upon the brownstone. There's no more brownstone <laughs> to build any buildings, and so we became quite interested in this line of thinking. Um, these are just my final slides, but uh, we've thought now that um, kind of the moment the different zeitgeist from Occupy and all these different efforts have moved into these more sustained efforts to, to work in parallel or inside of or outside of or negotiate or fight with art, the arts institutions and arts system, um, what is the place for people, our, people like myself, outgrowths of these institutions to, um, to make and shape these discussions? Often it looks like this, uh, which is not much of anything. Sometimes it looks like this. This is from UC Roski, um, a program that was also foreclosed upon. Sometimes it looks like this, um, or like this. Um, sorry, this is quite small, but another, I just wanted to include this as well. This is Simon's Rock Study Group on Institutional Transition and Mission. It's a very, very interesting text that was authored by uh, faculty and students at Simon's Rock. Uh, on their own occasion, of their own accord, and it was actually adopted, their, their process was adopted by the administration because it was so successful. Um. <laughs> um, I did want to bring this one up. I was actually just talking to Yates about this at the end, uh, just to think about um, how arts institutions, whether they're publications or, or brick and mortar institutions have come to be talking about some of the same things that we're talking about today, but in a very different context and with very different players. Um, it's, a, it's perhaps a point for a different discussion, but I thought it, it deserved inclusion. Um, mostly my work looks like this these days. Um, it's kind of, a, kind of a throwback to that first image, layered, a layered um, collage of just different texts, Occupy and, and art and otherwise. Um, and then these are this is the only uh, documentation we have of our original demands, uh, which were, again, for the president of Cooper Union to step down, for uh, the board of trustees to release the, the full finances, um, and just for, the, for the, the board and the administration to affirm the college's commitment to um, free education. I'll spare you this long one, but um, again, I have the book if you guys want to see it. Thank you, Victoria. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. I have a set of slides and then at the tail end of it I'm going to show um, a scene from a film that we're working on. And what I tried to do as MTL Collective, and Natasha Dillon isn't here, she's in Punjab right now doing research, but is to talk a little bit about our practice. Um, I'm a Palestinian, she's an Indian national, um, Indian national, and um, she, we worked together, we met at uh, the International Center of Photography, and during Occupy, we were part of 16 Beaver, and we were at the Whitney Independent Study right around the corner. Uh, Colby is in the audience, uh, Yates had gone to the Whitney Independent Study Program, um, but uh, um, Victoria's point uh, you know, my background is a Palestinian who came over here for the pursuit of the dream. And so I had gone to college, uh, studied philosophy, then law school, and then master's in law at Columbia, and then worked on Wall Street, and after five years, quit. Signed up on food stamps. That was, uh, many of the clients were Citibank and Delta and, and 
the people that kind of ruined the economy, and I was working on these billion dollar deals, and I didn't need an Occupy to leave that job, even though I come from a poor family. Um, but all this is the background that when I left, I made the decision to leave, even though my parents were in Palestine, and when my dad got really sick, um, part of living under occupation, people don't realize it's not just the killing or being occupied, but it's the fact that Palestinians don't have good health care, and they can't go from one place to another, and they don't have good doctors. And for my dad to actually get the kind of treatment that he needed, it would require him to go into Israel. And to do that as a Palestinian, you need a permit. And if you have um, pancreatic cancer, you're not going to be able to travel or to sit for a permit um, that you won't get. So by the time Occupy began, and this is just background, to, to kind of anchor it when we're talking about art or talking about life or talking about resistance and struggle and liberation and institutions, is the real lives are a hang in the balance. And um, even though I had worked for five years at this law firm, all I had was my 401k, which I cashed and brought my dad here. And by the time I got him here, he only had four months to live. And so what I was doing is that I was organizing an Occupy and then spending the night with him and doing that. What was really important about that is I was raised in Palestine during the first uprising and I was only 14, 13, had gone to prison twice, been shot already under the Israeli occupation, and my parents were very worried about me. And they said, why would you do such a thing? Why would you throw rocks? Why would you risk your life? Little, you know, teenager. And I told them, because what's a life without dignity? And my dad, who had only finished fourth grade, not longer, only fourth grade, had said to me, <clears throat> if you die, you die, and if you don't die, you'll be the one that's protecting the settlements protecting the people in power. And he saw that not as Israeli or Palestinian, but power. And when he came over here and he was dying and he visited Zuccotti Park once, <clears throat> he said, uh, this makes sense, right? Occupying Wall Street makes sense for Palestine. And so my presentation is about Palestine as one strand. This is an image because of militant research, thinking about militant research on the ground, where knowledge comes from. The notion of a researcher militant comes from Argentina, comes from way beyond that. But our institutions produce knowledge. So how can we, the knowledge sustains the kind of ideology. So if we're trying to resist, to fight back, to come out of that, how do we get the knowledge that isn't reproducing the same thing and just makes us feel better about ourselves because we can write articles in, in art forum and talk about post-humanism. Um, MTL, artist training in the practice of freedom. This is a phrase that comes from Gayatri Spivak. In other words, thinking about the training and the practice of freedom is something we don't know how to do. It's not that just we want our freedom. It's like, how do we live? And that's a practice and that's an engagement. So the principles, at least how we understand our practice, is the artist is an organizer. Research theory, action, and aesthetics, debriefing and analysis, the entire dialectical process is our art practice, or our living practice, or our life practice. Whether it's art or activism, this thing that everyone thinks a lot about now, matters little. It's what matters most is how do you deploy the knowledge that we have towards the kind of struggles that we're engaged in, which have to do with our life. Not about helping others, but helping ourselves, right? And there you can, you know, it's a site to, it's a nod to Fred Moten. Um, in 2010, we were in the West Bank. At that time, Tunisia broke out. We were taking these kind of images near a checkpoint, um, near a settlement, uh, near another checkpoint. We came back and we felt like something was in the air. So what we did was the Arab uprisings were happening and so we were getting the front pages of major newspapers around the Arab world that were experiencing uprising, printing out the front pages, translating the headlines, printing them, 
using the undercommons at various universities or institutions that we were a part of, 11 by 17, and putting them in public spaces. Bringing the rock as a notion of resistance. The rock has its own mythology, has its own kind of understanding, but at least in the Palestinian context, people threw rocks as a form of protection, self-defense, get the, the thing away. It's an act of, you know, it's not a violent act, but here we were putting it in around the city as a form of like, if you want to read, act. Remove the thing. Um, <clears throat> this is before be beginning, and just very quickly, MTL is in the West Bank. We're visiting friends and family, retracing memories of the first uprising, traveling, listening, recording. I read this because it's relating to what is the role of the artist post-Occupy and during Occupy. Land, life, liberation are on our mind. Mohammed Bozizi ends his life through self-emulation. Tunisia breaks. We return to New York. The city looks and feels different. Things are buzzing. We're watching closely. Soon Egypt breaks. We're seeing revolutionary people power from below, but it doesn't seem to apply to the United States. Even though we know it's all connected in the expanded field of empire, we say to ourselves, this is a revolution against decades of brutal military dictatorship backed by the United States. Those are not the same conditions faced by those living in the heart of empire itself. But then Greece breaks. Here's a nominal democracy, and yet people are rising up, taking to the streets and holding up the squares. Then Spain, a Western nation with an advanced economy in the midst of elections. With the crisis, people are compelled to occupy, throwing into question the legitimacy of their entire political process. Basta ya, no nos representan. Anyway. This, uh, this form of writing and image goes on the walls. This is in Oslo. I'll talk about just one engagement in relation to Occupy. So the image is the Victoria Ascent. What we were trying to do, one of the things that we were trying to do is a movement-generated theory. Again, this idea of knowledge and the idea that there's intergenerational knowledge. The commodification of knowledge exists. No, the intergenerational knowledge, the commodification of knowledge exists. So in that process, what are the spaces that we create and how do we learn? Not for the sake of a degree, but for the sake of, again, asking ourselves, what are we engaged in, right? So we, we came up with title Occupy Theory, and this was, you know, friends of ours, George Kofensis is in the crowd, Jaspier Poir, people that we know have been thinking about these questions their whole life. And then people who are on the squares, in the parks, in the streets, willing to get arrested, doing stuff, taking time out of their lives to do stuff, how can we think together about what to do thinking? Almost like a, not a praxis, beyond praxis, right? And this publication was a crack in capitalism. It was free, it was beautiful, it was out there, it was in public spaces. People were taking it, circulating it, no one was paying for it. And, and people were, you know, debt and or wages, organizing challenges, George is in the, the crowd, thinking together. And then an artist, George, uh, uh, Josh McPhee, sitting in the park, designing these things by talking to people about debt, right? Um, also, Silvia Federici commenting against that. Short pieces, accessible, thinking, not just theoretically, but how does it apply to the moment, to the now? Small steps. Um, and then in imaging here, where it's prostitutes meet to discuss forming a union. Um, indebted and in debt, we want land, not money. Uh, a history of doing. So, but also thinking about decolonization. And which, you know, decolonization, I think we should think hard about what it means, right? Because everyone's talking about decolonization right now. But, you know, part of how I feel it's very important is a rearrangement of relationships and desires, right? And that's, you can't undo a history. But the question is, is you can't sit with your privilege and then say you're fighting for the people that used to be on this land. Because in fact, 3% still exist. They're rendered invisible. So what's the role that we engage in in Manhattan? Colonizer as lender, Free Palestine, Occupy Wall Street, strike debt. 20 people worked on these 2,000 words. At the, this was the last publication, but it's empire on its head. This is why the conversation about Bernie is great, but limited. Right? 
So creative time, own issue, NATO and the like. But we were in Palestine again, and it's the slow, sure death of Palestine, and we were doing this, these things, which relate to the final thing that I'll be screening, Palestine cartography of an occupation, multimedia, what is a refugee if there is no nation state? Thinking about these questions critically, they're important to think about right now. You see the, refu the refugee crisis, but very few people are talking about borders have mattered very little for a very long time unless you have power. R drones are all the time flying. All of these things are happening. So borders, what are, they, what are they in relation to? In relation to our bodies, in relation to our relationship? Not in relation to capital. Um, from, from this Palestine work, which you could consider as research and aesthetics, we, Gaza war broke out in 2014. We operate under a lot of acronyms because when we say MTL, me and Natasha, it's not us. Kyle's here, Moena's here, so many people are in the audience. And we always work under different acronyms and we come up with these beautiful ideas and then we say, where's our people, right? Who, who are we that have a shared politics? And then we think about the intervention. Is it art, is it, are we willing to get arrested? Are some people willing to get arrested? Are we, we're engaged in the struggle. That's what we're doing. And in this context, when Gaza was broken out, we came up with a direct action front for Palestine. And we found the spaces in the cities, many churches to use. How, what's, how am I doing on time? Um, probably like uh, seven minutes. Seven minutes left? Wow, OK. Um, I'll run really quickly, because I, I definitely don't want to. Where's the uh, this two uh, videos? Because I want to give people a sense of what actions look like. Here um, here's the diamond. Um, the folks that are in this were actually they, you know, several of them were in ACT UP. Yeah, and so we did the research and we found from Occupy we thought of banks and financing of an occupation, and then we said, how can we not only do just like a creative aesthetic action, but how can we level a blow? On, on an institution and in the process elevate knowledge about that there are Israeli banks that are funding the Israeli occupation. And so this was one of them. Hopefully there's sound. That was an action, it was one of many, and then the other video, but maybe show the two stills and then the video. Mm, yeah. So this was a 90 foot by 45 foot banner. All the organizing around this happened offline. No phones, no cell phones, no email, no whatever, in the basement of churches, bought with cash, worked on for three weeks, no sleep created an alternative diversion, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, diversion on the Brooklyn Bridge and um, dropped it off of the Manhattan Bridge. And Kyle Goen, Gaza Love, he's the, the artist right over here uh, at the wall. Uh, no arrests, even though there was a risk of federal charges. This lent a viral tweet going out. Um, as far Egypt, India, it was amazing. And heavily covered here. So, I mean, what's similar with the Guggenheim, with this idea, is hacking the institution to become a media amplifier, right? It's a brand, and our presence in New York gives us ample opportunity to think of these institutions and places and 
Um, also with Kyle and the Direct Action Front for Palestine, there was a millions march out of Washington Square Park and the thinking was, let's make these amazing banners as an act of solidarity where 11 banners, I can't breathe, for what Eric Garner said for the 11 times that he said them, and one banner that says, when we breathe, we breathe together, and this is coming from the Palestine group, just putting the Palestinian kufiya on the edge of it. And then organizing affinity groups of three that are not associated with the march, but know of the march route. So as you're marching for Black Lives Matter, they show up in very amazing places, including where Eric Garner was killed. So it's a way of mapping as well, connecting these things um, yeah, so I, I'm just gonna, the, the, this is Venice Biennial, this is on direct action through EFLUX, you can read about it. Um, the intervention in the Arsenale, where <laughs> part of our own group, but then we, we augment it with Najil Ali Hamdala as a sign of resistance, who was also a migrant worker, and Palestinians are rendered migrant workers in their own land. Uh, the occupation of the Israeli pavilion. Um, this is through hyperallergic, uh, a letter for Palestine. Uh, Nina can probably talk about this, but the decolonizing, we organized this uh, DCF, Decolonial Cultural Front, um, connecting Brooklyn to Palestine as taking seriously this question of gentrification as a form of displacement and dispossession and colonization. Um, um, <clears throat> renaming what they have, you know, uh, settler colonialism tends to name things to erase things, so the excavation of that. Um, and an alternative tour, learning from Black Lives Matter and what they did at the Museum of Natural History. Stephen Shore, this show cost six million dollars, this project to put together. Um, but also working with the community there. Um, the artists who, with these black signs, or we will not be silent also. So a lot, who is DCF? A lot of amazing groups and people that came together under something that didn't exist until this action. Um, and now I'm just gonna show, thinking about, from you've seen a lot of art and activism, now you're gonna see something that's purely aesthetic, which is a scene from a film, how research, aesthetics, action lead into what we think is a shot at third cinema right now. Can we get the lights down though? Is it up? Is it up? It's separate, it's this, so you're gonna open it. So just one, I need to contextualize this just a slight yeah, okay. bit. Okay, so this is Ida refugee camp, which is right next to Bethlehem. Uh, Jaspir Pawar is over here, she was there, I think uh, during this trip, but not at this funeral. A 25 year old Palestinian was killed in front of a settlement coming home from the university. This scene shows up 10 minutes into the film, although you don't know that. You, don't, you won't know why he was killed. The, the beginning of, the, of, of it is just landscape shots, the kind of thinking of serial, AKA serial killer, uh, Masawadachi, thinking of uh, sweet grass for uh, the um, sensory ethnography lab, thinking of uh, several films that I can reference that we can talk about later. But this is the scene.
في 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 يلا استرجع لورا ارجع لورا يا اخوان نترجاك ورجع ارجع لورا انا اخذ مجال يا اخوان لو تسمحوا يا الله يرضى عليك اعطونا مجال العفو الله يرضى عليك ارجع ارجع يا علاء سووا طريق سووا طريق بالنسبة للسور هو قبل أن يعرف الجميع هو ابن هذا المخيم ابن مخيم عائلة أصوله من بيت نتي وأصوله من عجور فالسرور ليس ابن عايدة بيت لحم بل بيت جالة وبيت سحور ومحافظة بيت لحم ككل وليس أيضا أيضا العروب وبيت فجار وبيت أمر بل محافظة كلها محافظة الخليل وأيضا ليس ابن القدس منفرد بل ابن كل ذرة من ذرات هذا البلد من هذه من هذا الوطن من تراب فلسطين. 
that's a scene from the film, um, and we could talk more about it. Um, and then just the last slide from here, because I think it's important to um, acknowledge our people that aren't here. This is Natasha. Um, she's uh, also a DP and director on this, and you saw Habashi, uh, who's uh, an assistant um, producer on this. was when um, D, the um, DCF had their demonstration at the museum. So that took precedence. So it got published on that Monday. And then um, my article got published um, a few days later. And it, it was a great opportunity for me because I was able to change the first few sentences and say on the heels of the demonstration at the Brooklyn Museum. And so everyone thought I had written this article in a couple of days, but I had actually been working on it for months. Um, and what is kind of amazing to me now, because I haven't actually read the commentary that um, D DCF had written about the show, and there's so many incredible overlaps in the way we were looking at it, but, you know, I was writing an article. I, I'm, you know, I, I, most of my career I've been a curator. I was writing um, what was not actually a review of the show, but more a critique of the vision for the show, and um, and uh, some of some of what D DCF did was actually a critique, but an activist critique within the um, within the space of the exhibition itself. What tipped me off to this um, exhibition was a profile in the New York Times in February, right before the show actually opened, or right around the time the show opened. Um, by a freelance writer, Arthur Lubo, and it was basically a profile of this guy who was also a photographer, Frederick Brenner, who I'd never heard of before, and he turned out to be um, the, con he conceived the show, um, he, his family, I guess, left um, Europe, part, um, I'm not sure exactly where, but they moved to France during the um, Second World War. And um, after the 1967 war, they suddenly got religion and got the religion of Israel. And so his whole career as a photographer was focused on um, the um, Jewish diaspora. Um, so the show, he, as several people have said, he raised $6 million to produce it. And if you look at, it's very interesting, if you look at the funders for the show, they're mostly um, Jewish foundations. Um, the um, photographers that were selected, there were 12 photographers, um, are all very well known um, international photographers, except there, you know, there's some, in some situations, a little more nuanced than that. And, um, his vision, although there was a curator who I don't, I've never met, Charlotte Cotton, who I think is a curator at ICP right now, is called a curator, but I'm not sure her hand is on this show at all, quite honestly, because he controlled the vision of it. And the vision of it essentially was to present Israel, and several of the other photographers 
I guess, insisted that it also include the West Bank, and but not Gaza. And there's no mention of why Gaza is not part of it. Um, but he his, he wanted to approach it in a humanistic way, like there's no politics there at all. I mean, that to me is completely off the wall. I mean, I don't know how you can deal with the land of the land, even the landscape, without talking about the scars in the landscape. And it's interesting that um, D DCF also pointed out, used Stephen Shore's photographs as an example. I don't, have any of you seen, did you see the show, this place? I, yeah, so one of the things that struck me about Stephen Shore's photographs was that they're all these kind of beautiful, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not, my, my critique was not about the quality of the work or anything like that. Um, Stephen Shore, had a series of photographs of Hebron um, in the West Bank. And um, when you looked at them, they looked like a lot of shops that were closed. And to me, it, for, you know, I'm not saying to me because I knew a little bit more about the, the subject, but it appeared that these shops were, it might have been early in the morning, they hadn't opened yet. But right around the same time, I had gotten, I'm a member of Jewish Voice for Peace, and they send out these amazing um, commentaries on what's going on right now. It's like a summary of what's happening in, with Israel and Palestine. And you can really keep, keep up to very good date with, with all of that. And there, there's one commentary about Hebron and how this after 1994, um, a, an extreme, a Jewish American extremist um, massacred a mosque in Hebron and killed, I think, 25 Palestinians and something like 125 were injured. And after that, this street, Shuhada Street, where these storefronts were, were was completely closed to Palestinians from then on. A lot of Palestinians own shops there, they lived above the shops. They weren't even allowed to go to their own homes through the front doors. They had to go around the backs, over the roofs. None of this is explained in the exhibition. I mean, to me, it's kind of dishonesty, quite honestly. I mean, I just don't know how you can do that and just say, this is Hebron. <laughs> um, and this, this was kind of pretty consistent throughout the exhibition. You did not know what you were looking at, essentially. So I, um, I wrote this piece, and then um, I sent a copy, because Amin had spoken at the rally, and I knew a little bit of the work he did, and I wanted him to see what I wrote. So I sent him a link to the article, and it turned out to be an email address he never looks at. So, <laughs> uh, but he did get in touch with me, and uh, we got together, and um, had a really nice conversation. And um, so I've gotten a bit involved now, trying to help a little bit, not so much the film per se, but some of the writing around it. Um, and another thing that came out of this, at writing this, this um, article was that I was contacted by a um, woman who teaches at the Columbia School of Journalism, her name is Nina Berman, who is working on a project called 48 Stories, which is about Palestinian diaspora. And there are really terrific photographers involved, not, you know, not household names, not, artists who are represented by Pace or any of the you know big corporate galleries. And um, I had met her last fall at a Deep Dish TV salon um, where she was presenting this project. By the way, in, in projects she's involved with, there are four or five Palestinian photographers as well as other international photographers. And I was, you know, I said if they want to do it in New York, I would try to help find a venue and maybe work with them a bit. And so after she wrote to me, she read the article, and I said, hey, why don't we approach the Brooklyn Museum? And um, so this hasn't happened yet, and I'm not sure it will happen, but it's been great for me because this is an area I'm really, really fascinated, interested in, and would like to see more happen. And I think something that needs to be mentioned also um, is, you know, it's not, we, we were talking about cultural institutions today. I think another, another institution that needs to be um, brought into this conversation is the press, um, the media, because it's fascinating to me that this, this profile of um, Brenner that was written in the New York Times was so uncritical. So it was just like regurgitating a press release, essentially. And I also felt that, I mean, Roberta Smith's 
um, review of the show tended also not to be terribly analytical. They gave tons of space to the show on these two different occasions. Now there have been several other, I don't know if any of you saw a show at, um, it's actually an Israeli gallery that had a sort of pop-up gallery within um, one Rivington Street gallery. It was on the second floor and it was this fabulous video installation of um, a mosque that had been, that is partially used as a synagogue. And they showed now, because it's under the control of the IDF, and I mean, it's, it's, it's when I say controlled, it's monitored. And so all the Palestinians who want to go in there are, are, are led in by a team of IDF officers, military people. I mean, these are just people who are going to pray. And it's, it's kind of outrageous. And she shows this, this video, um, just shows the absurdity of it. So that didn't get covered at all by the New York Times. And there was also a show at um, Storefront for Art and Architecture, which was really quite good by Fazel Shi, who was in the this place exhibition. That too was much more, um, again, it was, it, it was much more, there was much more of a critique in the work in that show. And it was a beautifully installed show. They used, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, store, with the storefront, but years ago, um, Vito Conchi designed the door, the whole entranceway. So it actually, it, it became the wall, the, in, the separation wall. And so you actually had to walk, not, there was not one door, but there were different places you could enter. And you were very conscious of crossing over, uh, you know, sort of crossing a, a barrier in a sense to see it. That also did not get reviewed by the New York Times. Um, so this is something that I think we always have to be very aware of that the media is, um, you know, the media is the mainstream media. Um, and just to segue from that to um, something else I was involved with was, again, this was a um, Jewish Voice for Peace project that happened, I can't remember, it was like early February. It was a fake New York Times um, that, you know, probably some of you know the Yes Men have done a fake New York Times. And we're very, very grateful to the Yes Men. I actually helped with some of their, their newspapers. Um, but this was really a parody of New York Times coverage of Israel and Palestine. And I think one, something that happens is that if you don't know what's going on on a daily basis in, in Palestine, in the West Bank, in Gaza, you have no idea that home destructions happen on a daily basis. Evictions happen on a daily basis. Um, there's one Bedouin town that's been destroyed a hundred times. People keep the, the um, people who live there keep coming and building it, build, rebuilding it. None of this stuff gets reported. So when you go to see a show like this place, if you're not deeply involved with these issues, you don't really know what to look for or, or, or what's missing. And that's, I think, extremely dangerous. I mean, it's an extremely da dangerous way to present photographs or any other kind of cultural material. Um, I think there, there really needs to be an analysis. Um, you know, someone could say, well, that's just supposed to be a show of beautiful photographs. Well, I, I just don't buy that for a second. Um, so, um, let's see, what else? I also, I mean, just in terms of my interest in Israel-Palestine, I was a um, co-founder of an organization called Jews Say No, right after, right around the time of the 2008 assault on Gaza. And um, there have been a lot of kind of, I wouldn't say quite like the stuff you've been doing, but a lot of sort of attempts to um, do aesthetic, kind of perform performative demonstrations of not just standing, but interacting with people. Um, and so I think this form is, you know, is just really incredibly important. Um, oh, and related. Oh yeah. Oh, my book. <laughs> um, this book goes back to 1995, and it's interesting. Even Yates here, he he, he put me in a footnote in his book. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just teasing you. <laughs> but 
um, a lot of a lot of what we've been talking about today it was it was what the way this book came about actually is kind of interesting. Um, I was asked to co uh, to curate a show in 1991 on terrorism. 91, right? And it was going to be at the um, Maryland Institute College of Art, and there were two or three students who had died in the Pan Am 103 crash over Lockerbie, Scotland in, I forget what year that was, remember? No. And so when I came into this, I I didn't exactly know what their definition, I mean, I sort of assumed that their definition of terrorism would be slightly different than my notion of terrorism, or at least it wouldn't be as inclusive. And one of the joys of working on this project was that I actually was able to help educate the director of the museum and other people in the administration there as to the concept of state terrorism. And so the show became much broader than their idea of terrorism was, you know, a um, bunch of crazy Arab terrorists who bomb, you know, put a bomb in an airplane or something like that. And and state terrorism is a much more dangerous force in the world than you know individuals who are who are basically acting out of incredible frustration and oppression. And so um, the show and the um, symposium that went with it really focused on state terrorism more than anything else. And what came out of that was a, the, the, the name of the panel was, um, what was it? Um, it was Violent Persuasions, the Politics and Imagery of Terrorism. The show was called Beyond Glory, Representing Terrorism. And um, one of, a reviewer, of uh, someone who reviewed the show, criticized the fact that terrorism against women was not included in the show. And I, you know, I, I understood what, where that was coming from. And I actually, I communicated with her and I said that really we we're trying to address global terrorism. But for the book that came out, I actually did write an essay about terrorism against women and a number of the practices, and it was about artists who dealt with that, that issue, domestic violence, all kinds of violence against women, children. And um, there were a number of practices that I wrote about that were um, about public, public projects, part participatory projects, and um, as a result, I was actually invited to, I was asked by the publisher of that book if I thought that that kind of practice, process-oriented, participatory, activist, um, was, you know, was a real phenomenon that deserved attention. And I did some research and they really wanted to rush, rush it along, so I, you know, in retrospect, there's very little diversity represented, but there are a number of groups that you've talked about, like Grand Fury um, and others that ended up in the book. I didn't write the whole book. I, I invited essayists to write the various essays for it. I was also very um, flattered because Amin told me that he used it in his, he used my book in his class, so that was very nice. How am I doing? Uh, yeah, so why don't we move oh, on to the Oh, yeah, book? okay, yeah, okay, so. Uh, okay, so um, when I was at Wesleyan um, University, I was I was curator there for 14 years. Um, I did a show called Black and Blue, examining police violence, and that came out of work around um, Mumia Abu Jamal. Um, that was separate, totally separate from Wesleyan. But I became very uh, more knowledgeable about police brutality, and so I did the show at Wesleyan, and um, this. Um, this image is a, um, it's a wall of posters that um, I think Dred Scott, some of you might know Dred, um, he kind of assembled the posters and I can't remember, I think it was our, actually our museum preparator or exhibition you know, manager who put this, put this up on the wall. And um, the other image you see is a work by, uh, on, on that side, work by Pat Ward Williams. And it was this incredible installation about um, the uh, bombing of a community of actually African Americans and whites in Philadelphia called Move. Um, Philadelphia continues not to have great, um, I mean, at, at that time it was Frank Rizzo who was the chief of police and he was extremely rash, 
<coughs> extreme racist and reactionary. And um, they, uh, and Mugia Jamal, who lived in Philadelphia and was a journalist, wrote very critical pieces about the Philadelphia police. And as a result of that, they really went after him. And, you know, I, I am convinced he was basically framed. Um, so that was, and then the other piece was at, was made by um, someone who was a student at the Independent uh, Whitney Independence Studies Program, um, Adam DeCroix. And um, what we did for the Wesleyan inst installation, he was, um, all these police barriers had names of um, young black males who had been killed by the police. And because Wesleyan's in Connecticut, we um, adapted them a bit, so they included victims of um, police um, violence in, in, who had been killed by the police in the state of Connecticut as well. Um, the other image is by, um, uh, this, this one is by Carl Pope, and it's in the collection of the Whitney Museum. And I just have to refer to, because it's a long title, um, some of the greatest hits of the New York City Police Department a celebration of meritorious achievement in community service. And it was meant to be a comment on the fact that in certain police forces, when, um, when officers have killed gang members or black, in most cases, you know, victims of color, they actually give each other awards. And so these trophies, the piece spanned the years from like 1949 to um, 2000 uh, to 1994, and the trophies were designed in the style mm -hmm. of the way athletic trophies were designed at those particular times. Um, and they had the, all the documentation about who was killed and who the officers were. The other piece is by Dred Scott, and it's called Historic Corrections. And there's you know lots of references to police brutality, um, be, going back to lynchings, this electric chair. Um, and, it, and there was a, um, what was it, a, uh, God, now I'm forgetting. There was actually a club that was motorized and it would kind of beat on, I forget what, but it was just this constant sound of a billy club beating, you know, someone's head, essentially. Um, okay, let's see. Um, is that? Is yeah, that and, I, and, then I think, okay. and then I think something brings those Several elements. Well, I think, about, you know, I think exactly is in the action, in the the action at the right. Brooklyn Museum right. because it brings together um, dispossession in more than one area. So that, that's it. <laughs> Okay, so I think maybe folks who want to duck out is probably fine, although we, we can take some questions, but really ultimately we're going to have some beers and talk and whatnot afterwards. Um, Harry, did you want to, did you have any closing frame? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So if anybody has questions or thoughts, the microphone will go around. Um, okay, so should we, any, anybody? I know. <laughs> Okay. All right, let's give it a couple, 30 more seconds just of chill, and if anybody wants to jump in. If not, okay. All right. Okay, last chance. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Yates and, I mean, everyone. Thank you.